Hi. So I'm Seamus. Uh, I'm a vulnerability researcher. I've been finding bugs and writing exploits for seven or eight years now, most of that on phones. Uh, I particularly enjoy baseband's, but pretty much anything embedded is fair game, like a boot ROM. And I'm Aaron. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. My voice is a bit off, but uh, I've been doing Android. I like uh, mobile phones. I like all the non-Android parts of Android uh, firmware and uh, boot ROMs. I have a bug in every boot ROM. And today we've got a fun boot ROM bug to share with you. So a little overview of the talk so you can kind of follow this as we go along. Uh, we're going to talk about the architecture of Qualcomm's boot ROM and why you should care. We're going to talk about a bug we discovered a while ago, which is now patched, uh, but only on newer devices. You can't really patch a ROM. Uh, we're going to talk about how to exploit this bug. Uh, we're going to demo this, and hopefully it'll work live on stage. Uh, we're going to talk about how this was mitigated in newer chipsets and what the attack surface looks like now. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, the terms PBL and boot ROM are used fairly interchangeably in phone circles. It's just the part, the, it's the initial code which runs when you hit the power button when, and the chip turns on. Uh, it's a common target uh, across pretty much every major chipset vendor uh, because it gets you a lot of privileges. You know, it's been targeted in iPhones for Checkmate. There was a Huawei boot ROM bug which was made public a couple years ago called Checkmate 30. Uh, there's a bunch of MediaTek ones. Kamakiri is one of the more famous ones. Um, and now we're presenting a Qualcomm one. It's pretty much the most privileged portion of the chip. And its primary purpose in life is establishing the secure boot chain and loading the second stage boot layer from storage and kicking everything off. Um, Qualcomm uh, is a major chipset manufacturer. Um, as far as we're concerned, we kind of group their chipsets into three major generations, uh, starting with when they introduced LTE in 2012. Uh, you have the boot ROMs, which were 32-bit. Um, we're not discussing those here. Uh, there has been prior public research about those. Um, you have the 64-bit boot ROMs, which started with the Snapdragon 820. Uh, and there are still 64-bit today. But there was a major architectural change with the 8 Gen 1, or the 8450, if you go by the chip numbering, uh, about a year and a half ago, where they introduced some more mitigations to make a boot ROM bug hard to exploit. Uh, in this talk, we're focusing on that middle generation, where the boot ROM switched to 64-bit and added some new functionality. Uh, as for why you should all care about a boot ROM bug, um, ARM chips have multiple uh, privilege levels called exception levels. They go from zero to three. There's four of them, three being the most privileged. The boot ROM runs in exception level three. Uh, if you have code running in the boot ROM, you are the most privileged thing on these chips. You can break the secure boot. You can turn JTAG back on. You can play around with trust zone. Uh, you could take widevine keys out. Uh, you can break the secure boot in the modem and build a baseband debugger. Uh, boot ROMs are just fun. Cool. All right, so starting a little bit with the architecture of PBL. Um, as Shemis said, starting with uh, 8996, 8998, um, they shifted from this 32-bit to 64-bit PBL. Um, and one of the main things that changed with 8998 in particular is Qualcomm was getting tired of OEMs putting code in EL3 in the bootloader, and that code would be horrible, and people would only get EL3 access because someone decided to parse the images in the bootloader in an insecure way. So they added this new stage called XBL Sec, which is a, the only part that runs in EL3 and it's signed by Qualcomm only, so OEMs can't touch it. Um, OEM code only runs in EL1. Uh, but in order to load XBL and XBL sec from storage, we still have to go through PBL, which is running only in EL3. Breaking PBL gets you codecs everywhere. So uh, this is how the phone boots. Uh, simplified, actually. Uh, we start, though, with modem with um, apps PBL. Apps PBL has got to load XBL sec, XBL loader into it and kicks off this whole chain of things that'll load a bunch of other images, the real trust zone image, the hypervisor, the UEFI firmware, then your HLOS, your Linux kernel, um, which will unkick off things like your modem load and uh, various coprocessors, Venuses, like the image decoder, um, the video decoder, audio subsystem, things like that. For but, our purposes today, uh, we don't care about the whole right side of that diagram. Yeah. We're caring about only the code running on uh, the initial ARM cores, uh, so starting with the application boot ROM. Uh, 
All right, so in the old days, it was nice and easy. Uh, PBL was at address zero. They like to put your ROMs. You could get a kernel running with a dev mem compiled in, dump from address zero, and you got your boot ROM. Um, eventually, uh, they moved it around a bit, uh, made it a little harder, but uh, you could get like leak programmers that would let you dump various memory via peak poke commands. Or OEMs would forget to turn secure boot on, and you get one of these weird phones that just doesn't have secure boot, and you can do whatever you want. Um, but Qualcomm, I think, has gotten tired of people just being able to freely read their boot ROMs. So they have these blocks called XPUs that block access to um, the boot ROM from anywhere in the non-secure world. Um, when they added XPL sec, now the programmers and the uh, all the bootloader components that the OEMs can mess up for us only run in uh, non-secure EL1. So you know, if you get exec there, you don't get the access to the boot ROM. And I think Qualcomm's been nagging the OEMs to actually turn on Secure Boot these days, so it's harder to find phones without them. It's pretty hard to find a Qualcomm phone with Secure Boot disabled these days. Uh, so to dump out the boot ROM, you need a bug chain which lands you in the trust zone, essentially. Um, and these do exist. You can find them. Uh, there are other fun options. Uh, you can play with some fun microscope toys and see some bits. This will always work. It's just very time consuming. Uh, Qualcomm does have a bug bounty now to pay for methods of extracting the boot ROM. Uh, unfortunately, if you actually gave them a method, they'd fix it. You'd no longer get the boot ROM, so it doesn't really seem like a fair trade. Uh, All right, so in case you don't have a boot ROM, we're going to show you nice screenshots of Ghidra to burn your retinas. Uh, um, on the generation of socks that we're looking at, it gets mapped to address 300000. Um, it's going to be running, it's a very bare bones boot ROM, it's running only in a, a one exception level, no threading, interrupts are off. Um, and as Seamus said, its goal is just to load the next stage of the bootloader from somewhere. It has to figure out where it's going to be loading it from. Is it going to be loading it from SD card, from UFS, EMMC, USB, uh, and then trying to load it authenticated. Um, yeah, so single threaded um, in this from the, when you're doing a cold boot, it has this list of basically function pointers that goes through of various stages it has to perform. So like things like turning on caches, initializing various hardware components, um, figuring out what boot, what storage device it wants to boot from, seeing if that storage device is actually present, loading the uh, uh, image from that storage device, authenticating it, and then finally jumping and exiting to it. Uh, and function tables, Qualcomm likes their function tables. We also like function tables. They are uh, useful for us in many ways. All right. So what does the attack surface look like on the boot ROM? Its job is to load the next stage from storage. So you can have format parsing bugs if you can corrupt one of the bootloaders on the storage. Um, but there's also another interesting surface, which is USB. Uh, one of the boot mediums the boot ROM supports is USB. And this is commonly known as emergency download mode. Uh, it'll show up with a USB uh, PID of 9008. So if you're Googling around, you'll see references to 9008 mode or EDL mode on various forums. Um, this isn't quite accurate. Uh, it's not just an emergency download mode. Uh, certain Qualcomm chips support booting from USB as a feature. Uh, for instance, if your modem is attached, uh, you have a, a separate discrete modem um, that can boot over USB. On some chips, uh, like the uh, S10 5G, S20, uh, they couldn't solve the thermal throttle, the thermal issues on their 5G modems. So you would have an integrated 4G modem, LTE, in your uh, your SOC, with a separate 5G modem on the PCB as well. So those phones actually shipped with two. Um, so this is like a, not just an emergency download mode. It's a fully supported boot method. Um, the most common way to get it to it in a phone, though, is in an emergency fallback situation. Um, EDL is this packet-based protocol. I think it, way back down the line, it was derived from some protocol called HDLC. That's kind of the framing format. Um, it's kind of evolved a little bit from that. Uh, it's commonly known as Sahara, which is where the name of this talk comes from. Um, and its main purpose in life is to receive and authenticate a bootloader image. These are commonly called programmers or fire hoses, if you see them Googling around. Um, and then that will boot that into RAM. And that can 
fix various parts of the SOC. If you've corrupted your GPT, your partition table, you can rewrite it that way. Um, you know, test the DDR, uh, things like that. Um, reaching this on a phone used to be really simple. Uh, now it's a lot more complicated. Uh, you used to be able to ground certain lines on the USB connector, and the bootloader would see this and fall back. Uh, you could short some test points on the chip itself. Um, but that involves opening the phone. Uh, if you don't want to open the phone, your options are a little more limited. Um, you can, if you make the storage unhappy, whether the EMMC or UFS are the two common storage technologies in phones, if you make the storage sad, it'll fall back into a download mode. Um, with the switch to USB-C, um, they have a different way of checking signaling values to try and fall back. Uh, there's a variety of different ways. If any of these conditions are met, the PBL will choose to boot from USB. It'll go down a different code path than normal. And you'll see enumerate with this PID of 9008. Um, and here you can kind of see uh, it's going through some checks here. Um, it checks some fuses. It checks this magic cookie value in SRAM. It checks some GPIO values. Uh, and eventually makes a decision about going into USB mode. Um, so the setup for the Sahara protocol is pretty minimal. It sets up some globals and function pointers. It uh, turns on the USB stack. It has to program the USB hardware. And then it kind of just jumps into its little state machine. Um, and, and the general code flow here is we call this function PBL Sahara entry. It does some setup. It goes into boot Sahara entry and then into processing the packets. And you can see just how simple this is. You know, boot Sahara entry just calls an initialization function and then jumps into its packet processing loop. Um, the packet processing loop is fairly simple. Uh, there's, yeah, I don't know, what, like 12 commands supported or something. It varies a little bit between chips. Sometimes they removed things. Uh, there's a memory read function. Uh, you can transmit images, reset the state machine, things like that. On, uh, the, the protocol hasn't really changed from older chips. So the 32-bit PBLs had most of these commands. Uh, with the switch to 64-bit, they actually introduced a new one, which is where the bug is. Um, so with the uh, MSM8998, they introduced a new processing command, and there's, there's a flaw in how they handle things. Um, they, so uh, the bug in the Sahara. So it's very, actually this very last case here, the one they added, uh, which is just to reset the, the state machine. You'd think this is pretty simple. Uh, resetting things is easy. Uh, how can you fuck this up? Uh, pretty easily, as it turns out. And if you will recall the diagram I showed you earlier, you're going from PBL Sahara entry to boot Sahara entry to process packets. Well, uh, here it is calling boot Sahara entry again without ever returning from the process packet function, which uh, leads to a scenario you can create uh, with sending the appropriate commands that we can return from process packets into boot Sahara entry and then go into process packets again as many times as we want to just by sending a single US, you know, a USB command every time over the Sahara protocol. And this will add more stack frames every time, never returning up. Uh, there's no re-entry guards here. The stack depth only keeps increasing and is never checked anywhere. Um, would this be a problem in uh, like, you know, a high level operating system with virtual memory and lots of space? Eventually, yes. Uh, there's been some papers on like stack clash stuff, um, but generally no. You know, that's a pretty contrived example. Uh, it doesn't really actually work that well in real life. Um, however, this is a boot ROM. Uh, DRAM is not running yet. Uh, you have a very limited number of, uh, a very limited amount of internal SRAM that the boot ROM has access to. So there is a fixed amount of space available for the stack. Uh, and if you run off of that, you run the risk of corrupting other data. Um, early on in its setup, uh, the boot ROM reserves hex 3000 bytes for the stack space. Um, every call into this loop here will decrement that by six, hex 60 bytes. 
um, with enough calls, you can pretty easily exhaust this and uh, start to write to things beyond it. Um, unfortunately, on the chip where this was very first introduced, the 8998, uh, those 3,000 bytes of stack space are located directly above the base of this internal memory. Uh, so when you decrement off of it, uh, you hit basically memory which isn't mapped on the bus, uh, which causes uh, the chip to get very sad, and there's nothing you can do there. Um, thankfully, the following year, or about six months later, Qualcomm released a new chip. They moved where the stack was, and now you can do more interesting things with it. So, now the fun part, how to actually exploit this. Um, like Chambers was saying, on, uh, you normally think, oh, it's just an infinite recursion, it's just denial of service, that's no fun. Uh, but in the boot ROM, we have, especially after they have moved the stack into a more interesting place for us, uh, we have some interesting uh, options to explore. So the environment we're dealing with, it's in a boot ROM, at no ASLR, it's very deterministic. The stack starts at this address, we know exactly what depth it is going to be at a given function call. Um, they do have a few basic mitigations, they have stack cookies, they do turn on the MMU, um, enable like XN bits, that sort of stuff. Uh, the pain here is more that you you crash the boot ROM, you now have a phone that's just kind of sitting there doing nothing and you don't have a real easy way to communicate with it. Um, and every time it fails, you have to try hard reset the phone, yank a battery or do something like that. It's uh, painful. But uh, it can be done. Um, so just a basic overview of the layout. We're dealing with, for this presentation, we're working on SDM845. Um, so there's the boot ROM, which was at address 3000000. We have this region of memory called system IMEM, which is at 1480000. Um, another region called OCI MEM, which is used for XBLSEC later, but it doesn't really matter for us. Um, the stack is going to be initialized in that system IMEM block. And uh, yeah, if you go outside of like memory regions and you go into something that's unmapped, you're not going to you're going to cause the soft to get very upset. So that's why we can't exploit this bug on MSM8998. But on 845, the stack is right in the middle of this IMEM region. Um, so you can see the stack starts the top, the highest address of the stack is at 1480FDB0. It's hex 3000 bytes, so it goes from 1480CB00 to 1480FB0BB0. And below that you have these fun things like function tables, uh, Sahara state, um, USB stacks, uh, driver stuff. Um, and then all the way at the bottom actually at 1480000, you have the page tables for the uh, uh, boot ROM, which would seem like a fun target, but uh, the problem is that you have like the USB stack state and driver co um, globals in between here. If you clobber the USB driver globals, your USB driver is no longer going to work. And the only way you can keep doing this recursion is when you keep sending this packet to say, to, to call back into Boot Sahara entry. But these function tables are uh, within reach. And there's this one in particular called crypto F table, um, which you can see is at 1480C200. Uh, and there's a function pointer there one for, at 1480C248 called modexp, which is used for doing modular exponentiation. And that is a very fun target for us that we can, in fact, overwrite. Um, so uh, again, we don't really have the ability to debug this thing unless you have a pre-production device with JTAG. Uh, modern you know, production devices don't have that. No hardware debug, uh, no ability to see why, where it's crashing. And since the state machine is a little complicated and we're trying to exploit some global tables and things, it's very helpful to know the exact value of these things at various points in time. Um, pretty much the only way to figure this out was to emulate the entire boot ROM starting from instruction zero at the reset vector, which is what we did. Um, it was actually, I don't know, it didn't take too long, a couple days. Uh, you have to stub out some hardware things and figure it out as you go along. Um, just wrote it up with Unicorn. It's fast enough for our purposes. Uh, you know, sure, is it slower than hardware? Yes. Could you fuzz with it? Maybe, but it works fine for debugging. Uh, we actually got GDB hooked up to it, which sounded like a lot of fun. It actually wasn't that useful. We didn't use it much, but it did work. Um, so we have a little demo first of this emulator, um, just basically showing 
Uh, which one is it? This one and this one. So we have a little emulator going over here. We're going to emulate the 845. We have this nice uh, trace function where it will show you every function that's called and the stack pointer as that function is called, which is very useful for debugging a recursion bug like this. And then we're going to go over here, emulator. So you can see that. Uh, the stack pointer is going down, keeps decrementing it. As it calls, it's, we're sending this uh, packet, um, the reset um, state machine ID packet, keeps decrementing it, and it's going through. It's actually now hitting past the uh, end of the stack. It's now getting very close to the Sahara globals, and eventually it's going to hit that, and we're going to actually just get a crash where we access an uh, invalid address because we've overwritten globals in the Sahara um, for that used by the Sahara protocol, by that Sahara process packets, those globals get overwritten, you just get some sort of crash. Um, it's very similar actually to what will happen if you just keep repeatedly sending this command to a real phone. It might actually crash a slightly different point because on a real phone, um, it will be calling into more USB driver code that we've stubbed out to just hook, but it gives you a rough sense as to what's going on here. Um, so, all right, we can recurse, we can corrupt things. Now, how do we actually get data in here that we control? Um, the USB driver, unfortunately for us, has global packet buffers, which are not stored on the stack. So we can't just get in arbitrary data in a USB packet. That would be nice. Um, we thought about trying to overlap the stack with a global you could trigger a write to. Um, this seemed pretty complicated to do. Uh, so we decided to go down a different route which was overwriting global data uh, by triggering function calls, which we could control data that they access, and they would end up copying it into the stack. Um, the main way to do this and have a decent amount of data, which is actually usable for a payload or a rock chain or whatever, is certificate parsing. Um, the images are signed uh, that the USB, the boot ROM is supposed to receive over USB. Um, it's supposed to be a signed image, so it has to verify the certificates and authenticate it. And you can put a lot of arbitrary data of different kinds into certificates and still make it like mostly valid. Um, small detour here. Uh, Qualcomm has their own custom signing scheme here. Uh, they have multiple different algorithms you can use. In this case, the boot ROM supports RSA. Um, it's basically an ELF they wrap up with some extra fields. Um, and they have a certificate chain which authenticates back to the root of trust which is burned into the fuses of the chip. Um, and we control both the attestation shirt and the, uh, the CA. And we can manipulate the data within those a decent amount and still have it get to a point in the code that is, is beneficial for us. Um. All right. So from that, uh, you saw the process packet and that big switch statement. One of those is this hello response where you tell the phone basically what type of what you want to do. And the main mode that the boot ROM supports is transmitting the next stage of the bootloader to load, authenticate, and then jump to if it's happy with it. Um, so you send this hello response packet to the boot ROM, and it will go into Sahara receive image, which uh, it'll then go into Sahara receive image elf, because this boot ROM only supports elf format uh, um, images. Inside there, we're going to be calling this uh, function table, this PBL authenit. And the main point I wanted to make here is that you can see it's this crypto F table um, is being initialized, is being a pointer to it rather, is being copied into this S image handle. So that first line is setting that a pointer to the crypto F table into a different global, um, which is going to be used throughout various parts of the authentication code. Um, then once we uh, once we initialize the authentication subsystem it's going to receive this ELF image. Uh, receiving an ELF is easy. There are no bugs in ELF parsing ever. Don't worry about that. Uh, we receive the image header, the ELF header first. That receives the program headers based on the number of program headers the ELF header says there are. It'll search through the program headers looking for what Qualcomm calls the hash segment, which is where they store this authentication metadata, the certificate chain, and a signature for the whole ELF, as well as hashes of the, uh, each individual segment in the ELF. So it's going to look through the program headers, find this uh, um, hash segment, and then ask the uh, host to send the hash segment first before it asks for the rest of the elf. Um, uh, following this, uh, it 
the code flow is a little hard to follow here. Uh, Qualcomm really likes to use function pointers between everything. So you have that crypto F table we mentioned previously. There's a whole bunch of different function tables. There's the CMF table, uh, which is for the crypto manager, which is another little piece of crypto hardware. Um, and the code is chopped up into modules. Um, so image authentication and secure boot are kind of separate blocks of code, and they interact with each other by sending pointers and stuff back and forth. Um, so it's a little annoying to reverse engineer, actually. It's a little bit like trying to write object-oriented C, almost. Uh, but you stare at it enough, it's not terrible. Um, so you can see here, asking for the, uh, the hash segment, calls this authenticate function pointer to go into this secimgeauth function, which calls secimgeauth verify metadata using this s image handle, which now has a pointer to this thing that we can overwrite. Verify metadata is going to go through a bunch of different things to verify the uh, certificate chain in this. The main one being this um, second jaw uh, verify OEM uh, uh, SIG, um, which is verifying that the OEM has signed this image and it's a valid signature. In there, it's going to be calling this second jaw verify second jaw verify OEM SIG. It's got to call sec boot init using this crypto app table pointer again, which is going to copy that in the uh, bottom uh, left, uh, in the bottom right corner, you can see that it's copying that pointer um, to that crypto F table into a different structure. We're going between this secimge auth module and this sec boot module, so it has to translate these structs. But we still have a pointer to something that we can overwrite, and that's the main goal here. Um, eventually, we're going to call sec boot authenticate, which is going to call sec boot verify search chain, which is going to call secboot verify cert signature to verify that each certificate is uh, signed by the next one in the chain. And this is the fun part where it's going to be loading the uh, modulus of the attestation uh, CA and the signature from the attestation certificate um, into the stack for us. And that's going to be doing this module exponentiation to verify that you know one is signed by the other. Um, and this is the good part because we call this sec secmat bigint mod exp, which is going to be using this crypto F table pointer that we've been passing around through all these various modules. And it's going to be at the end on line 29 uh, invoking it. And if we've overwritten that, uh, it's now going to be calling something that we want it to call when we get PC control. And since this is a boot ROM, nothing moves around, uh, building a ROP chain is fairly simple. Um, we know exactly where everything's going to be, we know exactly where we're going to be on the stack. Um, and we actually even have room in the signature uh, to store some shellcode to jump to. Uh, we cannot jump to it immediately because the MMU is actually on, on these devices. So uh, XN or NX is configured, the stack is not executable, you would have to reconfigure the MMU to be able to run a shellcode. This does not hold true for all vendors' boot ROMs, uh, but Qualcomm does actually turn this on. So, second demo, we're going to get some nice, our favorite letter A in the uh, program counter because who doesn't want that? Uh, all right, so this one we're going to send a specific, rather than just trying to keep sending the pack until the thing crashes, we're going to send exactly 0x6e of these reset state machine ID packets, decrement the stack to this nice amount, send it then a certificate chain that just has a lot of A's in the uh, um, uh, signature and modulus uh, fields, and each of those fields is 512 bytes. Um, and we calculated um, that sending that many reset state machine uh, packets followed by the various stack frames of the authentication functions will then overlap the uh, modulus and signature with this crypto F table uh, global. And you can see that there now we have the program counter is 4141441, which is a start. As Seamus said, not quite enough yet. Uh, you can calculate the number of recursions needed completely statically just by reversing this out. Um, we did this to double check and make sure the emulator was correct uh, because we actually had some issues going from emulator to physical hardware we'll talk about later. So we're trying to verify our assumptions. Um, it turned out to be accurate, which is nice. Um, it's included for reference here if anybody wants to you know, play around with writing an exploit later. Um, the only thing to remember here is Every function call does have a stack frame, so you have to account for the stack frames of all the crypto stuff you end up calling to along the path to verify the search chain. Um, so it's math. It takes you know an hour of going through and adding up the stack depth, but 
It's not terrible. Um, like, like we mentioned, uh, you know, you need a ROP chain. The MMU is on. Um, we do have 512 bytes in the signature, which does get stored in the stack, at an address we know. So we can put shell code there. Uh, we'll know the address of this stack buffer after we recurse the amount of times we want to. It is pretty small for a ROP chain and a payload, um, but it's doable. Um, one other theme that we'd like to emphasize is it's very good to read the R manual, uh, a relevant manual for your processor. Um, we were first trying to get this working on actual hardware. We had it working in the emulator, looked great. Our ROP was running, turning off the MMU, jumping to shellcode. But in uh, actual hardware, it wouldn't work. And we were staring at this for a while. And we realized that our ROP chain was um, not flushing the uh, data cache uh, prior to jumping to the shellcode. And that region of system IMEM that PBL is using is very small. It's like less than 128K. It fits entirely into cache, and it's never been written back to actual IMEM. Um, so if you turn off the MMU by right, turning the SCTLR EL3 uh, dot M bit uh, without flushing the cache, all of that data that was written into, that you thought you, that the PBL thought it was writing to IMEM was in dcache, it gets discarded, and now when the processor goes to actually fetch from IMM again, there'll just be uninitialized garbage there, and the phone will be very unhappy. So uh, read the manual, uh, and uh, your shellcode will work better. So I'm just going to step through the uh, basic structure of the uh, ROP, job, whatever you call it. Um, this BLR X8 here um, is where we've overwritten that mod X function point in the crypto F table. Um, so you can see highlight in yellow, we have the crypto off table mod X function. Uh, we overwrote that with a pointer to this 3208FC gadget, and we just got to chain a few gadgets together. Um, one thing I think is kind of neat with this is that uh, traditionally you think of for ROP, you want to find a pivot of some form, and a pivot would be like, you know, I want to move something to SP. Um, in this case, there's not really a good gadget to do that, uh, but because we are um, executing such a static environment, we can pivot effectively by just shifting the stack pointer. There's more controlled data in the stack. So this gadget at 3208FC is just adding uh, effectively hex 230 to SP, which is now shifting the stack pointer from where it's normally going to be to pointing into the attestation signature, uh, the attestation certificate signature, which is entirely controlled data by us. So as we go through, we've shifted the stack pointer now to be pointing into the attestation signature and we're going to load up some more gadgets for it, and we can actually per continue doing our kind of traditional ROP of, you know, loading uh, X30 off of the stack, adding to the stack pointer, and returning. Um, so our next gadget is going to be this guy, which lets us load a bunch of different pointers off of the stack, which we'll be able to use later in future gadgets. Um, you can see each thing highlighted. Part of the data that we need to load here are um, this, we're going to be calling this uh, cache and validate function later, so we need to load the size of the region we want to invalidate um, and some other stuff. So, as you can see, it highlighting the various parts that are loaded in that turquoise color, showing you know what address we're loading from, and then the green and yellow are showing the values of these registers as they're being loaded. So, we've now incremented the stack further, pointing a bit further, but still in the controlled data. Um, Using some of these registers, X26, that we loaded from before, we're going to be loading more registers and doing more of a job style thing where we're going to be doing a BLR and actually returning from it. So what we're doing here is loading the address of the um, cache and validate function. And then we're setting up the address that we want to invalidate, which is space of system IMM, 14800000. That's going to X21, which is now being moved to X0. And then the second argument from X22 that we loaded earlier is hex 20,000, which is the um, size that we want to invalidate. And we've loaded X3 with the address of PBL clean validate cache. So now we can actually invalidate, we can clean and validate, flush everything out of dcache back into IMEM. Um, we return from that BLR because we're just calling a normal function. And we're loading the next gadget we want to jump to which is going to be this handy one that lets us load um, X0 and X30. Uh, so we're going to load the address of that gadget in, BLR to that. This one lets us load X0, X30, um, increments the stack, so this is back to a traditional raw. 
we're loading into X0 the new address of SCTLR EL3. And if you're not familiar, this has a bunch of different uh, control bits for the processor. The main one we're interested in is bit zero, which is the M bit, which is what enables and disables the MMU. Turning off the MMU, you can't have XN, everything is exec executable. Uh, we can jump to shell code. So we load X30, X0, then we jump to this gadget, which is now going to be setting SCTLR EL3 with the value we provided. ISB, make sure you do the ISB so it actually serializes that instruction. Um, now you've got the MMU off. We can load the address of 1480C070, which is a little buffer where we've stashed a kind of that uh, stager payload that Seamus had mentioned, which is still just in the signature buffer. Um, and then that's loaded into uh, X30. We are now writing to that, and we're going to be jumping to our little stager payload. Um, so at this point, we haven't even broken the USB uh, driver, so we can use it to ask the host for more data. And we're going to use this to request a larger payload that we can store at 1490000. Um, we figured out that on this chipset, that address in system IMM is basically untouched by the rest of the stages, so it's a nice little safe area to stash a larger payload at. So the uh, payload is pretty straightforward. We put the stack back to a safe, to a normal location, call into this function to receive the length of the payload and then receive the actual payload image and jump to it. The MMU is off, we can jump to our payload and uh, there you go, full shell code. So we do have a demo of this as well, showing going to the payload load. So let me bring this on up. So Again, we're going to send the reset state machine packet a bunch of times. And once we get to hex 6e, which I forget what that is in decimal, it's going to send the, yep, there you go, okay. So you can see here, we had this BLR, the, what we were showing in the slides of our ROP chain. We're tracing every instruction executed after that uh, point. So we can see the gadget to do our pivot, loading registers, calling into clean validate cache, I just uh, don't trace everything because it's a lot of spam there. We finish invalidating the cache. We go to our next gadget, which is going to be doing the uh, SCTLR EL3 write. We don't actually do that in the emulator because Unicorn gets mad if you do that, so we skip it there, but it would be right here is where there'd be that write to SCTLR EL3. And then we're returning to C070, which is our payload loader. And there you go, you got shellcode. So at this point, we have code running, we're good to go, right? Wrong. Uh, the biggest roadblock here from this point onwards is the fact that DRAM is not initialized yet. And when you, if your goal is to bypass secure boot and root the phone without tripping any fuses, you need to last all the way up through that horrible boot diagram we showed earlier uh, to when Android runs. Um, when PBL exits, only SRAM is enabled. So we have to patch through every single one of those boot stages, basically, to keep our payload alive. And ideally, if you want to support lots of phones here, you don't really want to have to customize this. You want to do it as generically as possible. Um, here's the kind of boot diagram redrawn to refresh your memory. Uh, so first thing you need to survive is XBL sec, which is also running in exception level three. Only Qualcomm controls this, Qualcomm signs it, nobody else gets to touch it, which means it doesn't change uh, at all. Um, XBL, uh, the Non-secure bootloader will make a, a SMC call, a, like a trust zone call, up to XBL sec when it's ready to exit. And uh, um, the code for that call is very static. So it's really easy to search for and stick a hook there. And conveniently, our little region we stashed our code in at the end of the last stage doesn't get touched. And it stays executable because XBL sec does not reconfigure uh, the page tables and MMU for that region. So we can hook and jump back to that region and everything works just fine. Uh, a little side note, when you're transitioning from the emulator to hardware, you hit weird bugs. Um, and this was the weirdest one we encountered and it took, I think, a couple days to track this one down. Uh, uh, well, weeks. Days, weeks. Uh, but um, we're basically, the phone would crash somewhere inside the trust zone, pretty far down the line, and we weren't patching trust zone at all. And we had no idea what was going on. Uh, so we're basically bisecting this and like making it crash at different points trying to figure out what's going on and we found out it's when the trust zone turns on the interrupt controller, uh, the, the main interrupt controller for the main chip. 
And when we dump the interrupt controller registers, there's a pending interrupt from the NOC, which is basically Qualcomm's word for a bus. Um, it's a bunch of buses. But so there's a bus interrupt, which is pending. The trust zone sees it and gets sad. Um, this is where it helps to read the ARM manual. Uh, like we said, it helps. Um, the interrupt was already pending when trust zone started and when XBL started and when XBL sex started. Um, we backtracked our way down the line and we found out that the interrupt is pending as soon as we turn the MMU back on. Um, a few instructions before a branch. And uh, we were pretty confused by this. Uh, we kind of thought there was like a bug in the CPU or something, like what the hell's going on here? And it wasn't exactly even when we turned the MMU back on, it was when we got near a branch instruction, we'd start adding knobs and it'd be like, we'd see that this interrupt would go pending as it got like close to, but not quite at a branch instruction. So we're thinking weird speculative, the execution bug, who knows what. Um, reading the manual uh, will tell you that uh, when you turn the MMU on, it's very important that you, any pages that are marked as, uh, uh, that you don't want to be speculatively fetched um, have to be marked as XN. When I was writing my initial shellcode, uh, I thought that, uh, you know, why would you want anything to be executed never? We want all, all of memory should be exec executable. Um, so I just went through the page tables and just cleared that bit on every page. Not a good idea, because when you clear that bit on a page, it now becomes speculatively fetchable. And some of the pages that were in these page tables were things that were not actually mapped onto the bus. So when we turn the MMU back on, this bit is, is, we cleared the XN bit before on something. The speculative prefetcher um, would try to access an address, like maybe address zero, which wasn't mapped anywhere, generate this bus error. The core never actually tried, it wasn't actually like a data abort. The core never tried to read address zero. It just speculatively tried to. The bus tried to then fetch the address. The bus got mad, raises this interrupt, but PBL has interrupts off. So the interrupt, no one hears it. And the bus is just sitting there saying, I have an interrupt for you forever until we get to a few million instructions later, somewhere in trust zone, after having loaded a bunch of different stages of the, of the bootloader, going through all of XBL, QC is trying to initialize, turns on interrupts, and this interrupt that's been pending forever now finally gets acknowledged and the phone crashes. Uh, the fix is uh, don't just turn off the XN bit everywhere, turn it off only when you need it. Yeah, that took a while to figure out. Uh, so then kind of moving along quicker here. Uh, if you wanted to, at this point, you can patch up trust zone. Why you might want to do this, I don't know, you want to like brute force people's passcodes or something. Um, exercise left to the reader. Uh, after this, we actually don't care about the hypervisor. It doesn't really do much in Android. So we can kind of skip that. And then you pack, patch the, uh, the core uh, exception level one XBL portion. Um, this is actually really nice. This made this really easy. Qualcomm phones use UEFI for this stage, uh, just like Windows PCs. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with UEFI, they chop things up into modules. These are called drivers or DXEs in their, in their horrible spec, which is way too many pages and way too many acronyms. Um, annoyingly, these DXEs are stored inside a file system, which is then compressed. So if you wanted to patch one of these, that sounds pretty miserable, writing your own like decompression and file system parser in your shellcode. Uh, luckily, due to some quirks in the UEFI behavior in the spec, uh, if you attach a, a driver to the end of this blob, not compressed, not in the file system, it also still gets executed. This made our lives very, very, uh, very easy. Um, you can just write your payload at this point in C using EDK2, which is the UEFI development environment. You get all the features for free, like the USB stack. Uh, so at this point, Later on in the boot process, you know, you can just play around with all these things. You don't have to implement the functionality yourself. It's great. Um, so we have real simple code, which just goes through and finds where the UEFI stuff is in memory and attaches our own special driver to it. And then we can now do all the same things you, any UEFI driver could do if it was like validly signed. It's a complete environment. Um, so we want to regain control at some point, right? Right before the Android kernel is executed, ideally. Uh, so there's this thing called the exit boot services pointer. And this is documented as exactly the thing you want to hook if you want to be the very last thing running before UEFI exits. Uh, if you Google this, lots of interesting things come up, including the spec, the unofficial spec, some stack overflow results. Uh, 
this is just what Windows rootkits do, and you can do it on the phone. Uh, it makes life simple. Um, at this point, you're about to jump to Android. You've regained control. Uh, there's a functional USB stack in UEFI, uh, so we can just use this to connect back to the laptop. You can get a nice little peek poke in your face over USB to read and write memory. Uh, then you can abstract lots of things on top of that to customize it for different vendors. Uh, it's really easy now just to uh, copy the RAM disk off the phone and put a nice rooted one back and then uh, continue on to Android. Uh, demo time. All right, so uh, due to uh, hubris, I guess, we're going to be doing a live demo. Um, we have this very high quality USB cable. We got nice nice bags and we're going to use this for this too. If it doesn't work, I'm blaming whoever made this USB cable, so we have a scapegoat. Won't we'll, we'll say who that was. Uh, yeah, it doesn't say it. I don't know. It says someone on it, but it should be fine. So this is just a Pixel 3 um, running stock firmware. Nice shade of kind of off pink. It uh, is using the SDM845 chipset that we talked about earlier. Um, so let me bring this guy up. Uh, so ADB devices. Um, yeah, cable's not working, is it? Right, come on. <laughs> there we go. I think you gave me like a USB-C cable that only works one way or something like this. It's just awful. I don't know. You... Anyway. Uh, not standards compliant. <laughs> so. Uh, one of the ways that you can get to EDL, if you have ADB access already, is this reboot EDL command, which sets a magic flag in SRAM that PBL picks up on, and then we'll go to EDL. So we do that. The phone's going to go into EDL. If you do that with USB, you can see there's this Qualcomm Q uh, 9008 device. It's calling it a modem for some reason. It's wrong, but uh, let's run a little demo. All right, so we're running in EL3 now. Yeah, we sent our payload loader, payload requested the full payload. What we're going to do is we're going to now pull the DTB off of the phone. Uh, we had our exit boot service hook. We pull the DTB, pull the RAM disk, use Magisk to patch the RAM disk up, put the new RAM disk in, patch the DTB to say here's where your new RAM disk is, and then tell it, keep on booting. It just finished. And it just finished. So ADB devices, ADB show, uh, there you go. Now you're root. Run a little over time here, so we're going to just blow through the last couple of slides real quickly. Uh, but uh, ROMs are kind of expensive to change. Uh, they're at a very low layer of the chip, so changing it involves respinning a whole bunch of silicon bits during the fabrication process. Uh, it's expensive. Um, the next, the 8250 chipset, the Snapdragon 865, has this bug in the ROM, uh, but they actually kind of mitigated it without respinning the actual mask ROM, which, which was really interesting to us. Uh, if you disassembled the code, or decompiled the code, you see uh, this extra little check here where uh, it doesn't call boot Sahara entry anymore, it calls boot Sahara init. Uh, it sets some global variables because they screwed things up. Um, how that actually looks in the assembly, though, is like this, where there's a branch off to the very, very end of the boot ROM where there's no other coding or near this. It does a couple little things and then branches back into the function uh, that it came from. And like no sane compiler is going to generate this and stick a tiny little function stub way off at the end of the ROM. Uh, and how this actually appears to work, and a little bit of this is guesswork, uh, but you know, smartphones use fuse banks, your secure boot states stored in the fuses. Um, the Snapdragon phones have a set of rows in here which are reserved for something called ROM patching. Um, and each row contains an address and some data to put at that address, presumably. Uh, and there's a little bit of guesswork here, but there's some sort of mux which sits in front of the ROM uh, on the bus. And when an instruction is fetched from the ROM, if that address is in these fuse patch rows, uh, you get the patch data back instead of the actual ROM data. So this is what they used on the 865. So the bug was found before the chips left the factory, but after they already done all the work. So at this point, they could just program some values into these fuses, which is, you know, pra cost practically nothing, way cheaper than respinning the, the ROM, and fix the bug. So 
pretty much every production 865 device has this patch, unfortunately, which, which is kind of sad. Um, there's bugs there too, but new bugs. But this particular one I was very fond of. And it has an interesting uh, history of how it was found and when it was fixed. Um, it was introduced uh, with the 8998 chipset in March of 17. Uh, it was actually made exploitable on the one we demoed in December of that year when they released a new chip. And then it was patched two years later uh, by these fuses. Uh, and then it was actually fixed in the ROM a year after that in the you know, following generation chip. If you get an 8350 boot ROM and you disassemble it, no traces of this kind of weird patch function. Um, then there was no CV assigned to this. It was silently patched. Uh, and then a researcher named Chris Wade uh, reported this to Qualcomm another year after this. Uh, and then the CV was assigned and this was kind of released publicly. Um, and my supposition or our guess for why there was no CV previously is it wasn't recognized as a security error. It was a functional issue and the boot ROM team fixed it without classifying it as a security bug. And they didn't actually realize it was a bug until somebody else told them. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so going back to the way the bad when we talk about the generation of chips, starting with 8450, uh, they add this new component to the uh, boot process called the Trust Management Engine, the TME, which is actually a little RISC-V core that is responsible for a lot of the authentication functions that uh, PBL was uh, previously entirely responsible for. So the application PBL, the one that's running on the application cores, is no longer actually able to just boot the whole sock on its own. It has to kind of ask the TME for permission, and then TME says, look over the image that's trying to load and says, okay, yeah, I'm okay with this, you can keep going. So at this point now, you need to get a bit more, you need more bugs basically. Uh, just having execution in apps PBL is not gonna get you everything like it used to. Um, yeah, just need more bugs, it's easy. So yeah, uh, we're a little bit over time. Happy to take questions, but you can always find me at lunch too. Uh, so that's all.